This is Jewish Spotlight, a weekly television program presented by Chabad Lubavitch of Long Island, featuring various aspects of modern Jewish life and Jewish culture. Now, here is your host, Rabbi Tuvia Teldin. Shalom, and welcome to the Jewish Spotlight. Tonight we're going to take you for a very special journey to a place that you've never been before. Once in a while in the Jewish Spotlight, I'd like to introduce you to somebody who's been to places and done things that none of us will probably ever have the chance to do. And as a result, they can share with us a little bit of their experiences and give us a little bit of an insight in a different part of the world, a different part of life, a different part of being Jewish that we're not exposed to up till now. And we're happy to have with us today somebody who's literally traveled the world and who's had tremendous experience, especially in the Far East, and can tell us a world about Judaism in the Far East. It's our pleasure to have with us today Rabbi Marvin Tokea. Rabbi Tokea, welcome to Jewish Spotlight. Thank you very much for the invitation. Well, it's our pleasure. And I understand that you were the chief rabbi of Japan in the 60s and the 70s. That is correct. I also was a chief without Indians, but I was, for most of that time, the only rabbi in the Far East. In the, far, the whole Far East. Right. So my congregation included India, included Singapore, included China, included Japan, included Korea. There's a lot of territory. So people would actually come to you for questions or problems or difficulties, family events, to Japan because you were the only one available? Either, well, if they didn't come to me, they would certainly contact me. You could right. certainly send a telegram or certainly could telephone. Right. But I was responsible for all religious, educational, and cultural affairs of the Jewish communities of all of the Far East, including India. Incredible. How did you end up in the Far East? I'm sure when you grew up, your mother wasn't thinking, isn't that a great job for a nice Jewish boy? Actually, I had no interest in the Far East, wasn't curious about it, and it really was not part of my dreams at all. But uh, prior to being married, I sent an invitation for my wedding to the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And, uh, he asked me to come together with my fiance, maybe to get a bracha, to introduce ourselves. I had met him for several hours while I was a student. I wrote, him a, quest I wrote a, a letter to him saying I had some questions in Jewish philosophy. And we met uh, one evening for several hours together. Really? Yes. And then I sent him an invitation to the wedding. And uh, when I uh, came to meet him together with my fiance, the first thing he said was, uh, I think you should go to the Far East. Just like that? Just like that. And. Uh, I mentioned to my fiance at the time, and she said she thought that the moon was probably closer. So no matter how I directed the conversation, he always said, I think you should go to Japan. And then when I asked him, why does he want me to go to Japan? He said that no captain has a right to abandon a ship. And there are isolated, remote, faraway Jewish communities, right. and someone has to be there. And he said that you know Hebrew, you know Yiddish, you know English, you don't have to spend a lifetime there, but now is an opportunity when you can be, give some service to your people and go there for a few years. I went there originally for two years, mm -hmm. hoping to come back. Well, I thought I would come back in two years, but the years were really fascinating years, and I learned a great deal about myself as a human being, as an American, and as a Jew. And the two years, I guess I overextended my stay and was there for more than 10 years. Interesting. And yeah. what was so fascinating? What interested you about the communities there? And wasn't life very difficult, so weren't the obstacles be more strong in your mind than the curiosity that you had about the countries? I would say obstacles are challenges, and you really can overcome challenges, or you can deal with challenges. My first day um, in Japan, when I arrived, the community had a cocktail party to welcome the new rabbi. I was the first rabbi, or first professional rabbi of the community. And uh, I was there, and the first person that came through the door came down the stairs, and I extended my hand and said, hello, shalom to him. And uh, I don't know why I asked the question, but it certainly changed my life. I asked innocently, where are you from? Assuming that everybody's going to be from someplace else. From Brooklyn. From Brooklyn. Or the Bronx. Or the Bronx, <laughs> correct. Uh, he looked at me and he said, I'm from Mongolia. To be honest, I did not know where Mongolia was on the map. I said, Mongolia? I said, what were you doing in Mongolia? He said, I had a department store in Mongolia. I did not know they had department stores in Mongolia. <laughs> and he says, don't worry, Rabbi, it was Shomer Shabbos. It was closed on the Sabbath. And he took a photograph from his wallet and showed me a two-story department store with a Star of David above the main entrance. Well, that threw me for a loop because I realized that I was dealing with a congregation. I had no clue as to where they were from and what they were doing. Right. The second person that came, um, I asked him, uh, where were you from? He said, Japan. I said, where were you during the war? And he said, Japan. Well, I was raised in America during the Second World War, and Japan was the closest ally of Nazi Germany. And I knew of the horrors of the Holocaust of Nazi Germany, as well as the horrors in the Pacific as well. Mm -hmm. And with Japan being the close ally of Nazi Germany, I said to him, it must have been terrible here for the Jews during the war. He said, no. 
I said, there must have been concentration camps. He said, no. I said, there must have been great persecution. He said, no. He said, if only more of our people were here. Well, this to me was a great paradox. I had never learned, I'd never studied, never read, no one ever mentioned that actually there were about 50,000 Jews in Japanese territory during the war. What were 50,000 Jews doing in Japan during that time? Well, they were in Japan as well as Japanese territory because Japan was very uh, colonialist at that right. time and it conquered, conquered Taiwan, conquered Korea, conquered China. They parts were there on China. business? They were there for what purpose? Well, some were refugees who had escaped from the Nazis because the, the only place that a Jew could go to without passport, visa, money ransom, or trip was Japanese territory. And there were about 20,000 refugees who had escaped from Nazi Germany without really documentation mm -hmm. and were accepted into Japan and into China. There was a, a Sephardic Jewish community from Baghdad to Basra to Bombay to China. And there were Russian Jews from Siberia into Manchuria, which is northern China, into Tianjin and into Shanghai. Now the, this is all during or after dur the war? This is during World War II. So let's say during before World War II, were there any Jews in that area at yes. all? Before World War II, you would have all the same Jews except for the refugees. So you would have about 30,000 Jews in Japanese, or 30,000 Jews in China, as well as Japan. During, before the war, uh, or before now, how, how did Jews end up in that area? How did Jews come there? Well, it depends where they're coming from. If um, uh, they're Chinese Jews, and there were uh, tens of thousands of Chinese Jews, ethnically Chinese Jews, in 15 different cities in China, and we have records going back over a thousand years. Uh, Catholic missionaries, Father Matteo Ricci in 1605, met uh, Chinese Jews. Uh, the Chinese record that in the city of Canton, or now pronounced Guangzhou, in the eighth century had a great flood, and many Chinese and Jews lost their lives. We have figurines about this large, of uh, a man with a Semitic nose, a gray beard, round eyes, and they're not Chinese features, uh, with a wearing a skull cap, or wearing a hat, and it's really? a uh, sack over his shoulder, and it's in the Museum of History and Culture in Tiananmen Square in Beijing, and the sign says Jewish visitor to China, the oldest visitors to China, and these figurines are way over a thousand years old. Amazing. So we've been there a long, long time. Of course, we know that after the destruction of the Second Temple in Jerusalem, this is going back almost two thousand years, the Jews dispersed throughout the entire world. But of course, th there is very little talk about them having gone to China whatsoever. The furthest you really usually hear about the Jews having gone was to India, Correct. where there was a very large Jewish community, the Bnei Yisrael. And it's before the temple's destruction. The Jews in India, uh, the Jews in the Cochin. For example, the uh, Romans record that there were large Jewish communities up and down both coasts of India in the first century. The Christians sent uh, missionaries, sent St. Thomas Apostle in the first century to bring the message of Christianity to the Jews and this is uh, before the destruction of the temple in the year 70. So there after the destruction, even more Jews even came? Even more came. There was a uh, Jewish king of a Jewish state in the fourth century uh, in India. And uh, the Bnei Israel uh, came to... Wait, there was a Jewish state in India? A Jewish king of a Jewish state. Really? In India, which we don't talk about. And if you visit a synagogue in Cochin, in a village called Jewtown, and the synagogue is on a street which is called Synagogue Lane, which is fascinating unto itself, they have in that synagogue the original copper plates dated to the year 379. And the copper plates are etched in Tamil, which is their local language. And they read, so long as the sun should shine by day and the moon by night, that's forever. No one except of the household of Israel shall sit upon this throne. The house of Israel is a Jew. Interesting. Sitting on a throne is a king. And this goes back to the year 379. Amazing. And one of the uh, Spanish poets, uh, Rabbeinu Nisim, uh, wrote a fascinating poem, which in India they still read uh, in their synagogue service on Shavuot after Passover. And uh, Rabbi Nisim writes that the Jews of Spain would save their coins to travel to India for the honor of seeing a Jew sitting upon a throne. And the last line is, him I saw with my very own eyes. He also traveled to India really? to see a Jewish king sitting on the throne. Now, what happened to these Jewish communities? They're still in existence, they've dispersed, they've assimilated. The, uh, the Bnei Israel community, which came during the time of the Hanukkah persecutions, they came and they escaped to India, unfortunately went into a storm, into a monsoon, and had a shipwreck, but nevertheless some survived. Uh, they now number 50,000, 50,000 50, in Israel and 5,000 still in Bombay. Okay. They had the entire Jewish calendar, were totally Jewish, except they never heard of the holiday of Hanukkah 
since they left before the before story Hanukkah. of Hanukkah. Amazing. They, they never heard of it. The Jews of Kuchin, which go back to the first century or a little before, uh, they're in southern India. Uh, their community uh, dwindling now. They only have, I was there in December, they only have 11 left. They picked up in 1949 and 1950, picked up and moved to Israel and have settled uh, very, very well right. in, in, in Israel. Now, how about the Chinese Jews? You're saying that there are Jews who went past India and continued to China after to China. the destruction of the temple? And uh, that's that how those correct. communities that began? Correct. That is correct. And what the, happened to those communities? The Jews of uh, China came originally from Persia, from Yemen, and from Bukhara. We know this from their Hebrew school textbooks that they have. By the way they pronounce Hebrew, we know they're from. We know their prayer books can also say what different style of prayer mm -hmm. uh, they, were, they were reciting, could tell us where their oranges were, or their uh, Passover, Haggadah. If they have words in a foreign language, we assume they know that foreign language and those words are in Farsi. So we, knew, we know they came from, um, uh, from Persia. Uh, the Jews of, uh, uh, of China uh, were so welcome, so accepted, and so assimilated and so divorced from other Jewish communities that uh, basically you could say they assimilated and were swallowed into the Chinese society. Mm -hmm. And today you only have descendants mm -hmm. of Chinese Jews without really having a functioning. Do they maintain some of those traditions? The only tradition they really maintain today is uh, the absence from pork, do not eat pork products, and uh, fasting on Yom Kippur 10 days after really? the new moon. Other than that, and they generally try to marry among themselves, but on their ID card, when any child is born, you need an ID card to this very day, even though they may practice nothing and know nothing, they write on their ID card that they are Jewish. And so there are tens of thousands of Chinese who have on their identify ID card themselves identifying as themselves as Jews. Fascinating. Yeah. Now, Robert Takeda, let me ask you a, uh, a question. The Dalai Lama, yes. who is the spiritual head of the, the Tibetan Buddhists, who, right, the Buddhists, who of course were sent out of Tibet and put into exile. He showed a tremendous curiosity and interest in the Jewish people. Why? Because his people now have been in exile from their land for 40 years. The Jewish people, he knows, have been in exile for almost 2,000 2, years. So he wants to find out from the Jewish people what is the secret of staying united as a people and surviving and flourishing during a time of exile because he, as far as he knows, he doesn't know how long it's going to take before he's able to return to his land of Tibet and be able to reestablish his religious empire. Now, the question I have for you is this. How would you answer, on the basis of your experiences with the small communities that you see of Jews throughout the world, how would you answer a question like that to the Dalai Lama? I think the better person to ask would have been my daughter. My daughter lived next door to the Dalai Lama oh, really? uh, for six months and speaks uh, Tibetan. And, uh, in where? He's in Dharamsala in India. In North India. He, he's, in, he's in exile in North India. That right. is correct. Uh, the truth is that the, uh, Tibet is a fascinating society. You should know that the uh, oldest Hebrew manuscript on paper found anywhere in the world was found in Tibet. Oh, come on. In Dandan Ulik. And nobody Before knows Dead that. Dead Sea Scrolls? It's, no. This, first of all, it's paper. It's not a scroll uh -huh. and it's not parchment. Okay. But it's about 1,500 years old. So we were in that part of the in world. In Tibet? In Tibet. In Dandan Ulik. It was found by a British archaeologist in January 1900. And a French archaeologist found another document a few years later, a few months later, actually, which is in Paris. So we were in that part of the world a long time. I have a great deal of fascination with Tibet, and I really feel for the Dalai Lama or the Dalai sure. Lama. And um, he is in exile, that is true. And he has tens of thousands of followers in India. Right. And when he researched what happens to a people when they go into exile, and his research showed that every people that is moved out of their native homeland, out of their language, their culture, their climate, their environment, their religion, to a foreign country, they assimilate and swallow into the dominant culture. Without and exception. He, without, accept, without any exception. And Except he was afraid, he was afraid that his, he himself and his people, who are in large numbers in, uh, in northern India and going elsewhere, uh, and he may not be able to return to uh, his homeland in Tibet because of the friction with the People's Republic right. of China, his research found that there was only one people that survived outside the homeland intact and that was the Jewish people. And so he then had to study the Jewish people. So it's not so much of a curiosity. For him, it's survival. And he has uh, some of his followers 
who are attending Jewish summer camps in America, really? attending fundraisers in America, <laughs> attending Jewish schools in America, to see what is the secret of the Jewish survival. So what is the, the secret? What he has learned, and what this, the secret is, okay. is that you have to maintain a language. You have to see what Jews have done everywhere around the world to survive. We are still Hebrew literate, even though Hebrew is not the language of America, or of France, or of Portugal, or of Germany, or of Poland, or of China. Right. So you have to keep a tie to the original, to the homeland, to the language, because that language gives you the key to your sources. You can read your text in the original, which is far different than reading them in translation. In a different, you're going to have to create holidays, ceremonies, songs that can relate you to your religious tradition and to your homeland. You have a Sabbath every Friday night. Well, America's Sabbath is not Friday night. Yet, no matter what's going on in America, no matter what great event is occurring in America, there's a candle lighting time, the family's together, and you have a special meal and a special prayer, and it's a special mood. You feel very Jewish at that time. If you made Friday night into Tuesday night, you wouldn't feel Jewish at all. And so these holidays will tie you to your homeland, to your religion, to your culture, to your language. Using the summer camp, using the summer vacation time, you can spend uh, two months of summer vacation, as our children have from school, mm -hmm. just playing basketball for two months. Right. You'll be very healthy. It's very nice to get a suntan. Mm -hmm. It'll never make you more Jewish. Use that time, which is a free time, to study, to be educated, to have special programs, special holidays, special events related via film, via video, and then you would have a tie with a new generation to its ancestral roots. So the Dalai Lama, to a certain degree, has to recreate a whole network or a system within the, the Buddhist religion in order to be able to create that structure for people to continue their religion? Doing it right now, as we They're speak. creating it. That's correct. Interesting, That's because with Judaism, it's very different. In other words, the Shabbos, for instance, the holidays, the Shabbos uh, candle lighting, the traditions, the, uh, all the things were there from the time of Mount Sinai. So I would propose to you that really when the Torah was given, it was given to be in a state where you're in your homeland or to be in exile. In other and words, it applies to any situation whatsoever. But they don't have such a situation. They don't have to. So, so they you, have to now you create, have to create it, it. Going right. You have to create the ceremony. You have to write the songs. You have to create the events. Right. Because their system, as most systems are, to be used in the homeland. They don't have to worry when they're in Tibet. They have to worry when they're outside of Tibet. Right, right. Very interesting. Now, I've heard you talk also about the Fugu plan. That's correct. Could you tell us a little bit about what that is? Because it sounds quite fascinating. Fugu is a Japanese word for blowfish. It is the delicacy of Japan. Fugu is a, a small fish that when it feels itself under attack in the water, it blows itself up like a small right. globe. And other fish in the area are obviously going to run away from this crazy fish that's blowing itself up like a balloon or like a globe. But Fugu is the delicacy of Japan. It is really delicious. However, it has within it a colorless, odorless, tasteless poison. You cannot see it, you cannot identify it, you cannot taste it. If you should have the equivalent of maybe one grain of salt or less that you cannot even see, you are guaranteed, without any exception, a violent, painful death, no way out. Okay. Fugu, when it is good, it is delicious. I get the message. When it is bad, it is terrible. <laughs> okay. That was the code word, the metaphor, that the Japanese used for a plan, a top secret government plan, to save all the Jews of Europe during the Nazi period, during the Hitler period. The Ju Japanese wanted to save the Jews. The Japanese wanted to bring millions of Jews to Japanese territory at the time of Hitler and the time of the persecution. Is it documented? Absolutely. All documented. All documented. Okay, let me hear more. At the cabinet level, yes, which is the highest level of the government. And there was a, a document signed by the prime minister, foreign minister, finance minister, army minister, navy minister, called the Five Ministers' Conference, authorizing the acceptance of all the Jews into Japanese territory, whether it was China or whether it was Japan, any place. Was this publicized during the time of the war? Publicized, well, First of all, this was a Japanese government decision. Right. They negotiated it in America. They came to America and offered this option. And the American Jewish leadership at that time turned it down and turned down that option. That's another story. But the Fugu plan was the plan of the Japanese to save the Jews during the war. What, what, first of all, what interest should the Japanese have in saving the Jews? The Japanese had several interests, and it was not necessarily a unanimous decision. Uh, the Japanese, uh, some believe that they have to follow the Germans. The Germans were their closest ally, and that is true. Right. And they will follow German policy, and I understand that. 
Some Japanese, however, believe that the German policy was not in their best interest, that becoming a militaristic country, going on the warpath, declaring war against China and America and England and France was a total waste of money, and uh, becoming colonialist where people will stab them in the back was not in their interest, that perhaps there was an alternative, an alternative way to become rich, powerful, and invincible. And that's what they all want. And maybe they can do it by big business. Maybe they can do it by making a great product, selling it, and people will buy it whether they love them or hate them. The problem is that today when Sony is such a popular product, and when the Honda and the Toyota are such a popular product, but in 1938 and 1940, everything made in Japan was junk. And they didn't make a good bicycle, or a good typewriter, or a good shirt, or a good pair of shoes. If you pulled a thread on a Japanese shirt, the whole thing would fall apart. And they thought that since Jews are a talented commodity, and wherever Jews live, there's an abundance of culture and economic success. If Jews come to Japanese territory, and the Jews are not a threat to them, and there's no anti-Semitism there, they had, they thought anti-Semitism was a Christian problem, it had nothing to do with them. They thought with Jewish expertise, Jewish manufacturers, Jewish engineers, Jewish musicians, they would raise the culture of the country, start to make a good typewriter, start to make a good bicycle. They could sell it, they bec become rich, powerful, successful, without the necessity of the war in the Pacific. So once the Jewish American community rejected the plan, did it the die The government then? failed. There was a government of big business that was betting on this. The government failed. You had a new government that was a militaristic government that was not afraid to rattle sabers with America. Almost overnight, you have Pearl Harbor. Oh, so Pearl Harbor came right after this new government that. came in. This was a plan that would have prevented Pearl Harbor. Incredible. That's, that's the story, in a nutshell. Amazing. OK. Let's get back to some of the other Jewish communities. Shanghai. Yes. Very interesting Jewish community. I have a very limited understanding of it, but from what I can see, it mostly was established after the war, at least during the war. The refugees came during the war. This was their escape. Get out of Russia, go away from the war, get over to Shanghai. There were yeshivas that were established there, Talmudical schools, and all types of other things. Let me stop you. The, base, the information is incorrect. Okay. Shanghai was established long before the war. Okay. The first community was a Sephardic community which came from Iraq, from Baghdad, to Basra, to Bombay, to Shanghai. They were really following the British. And they were a very successful, very prestigious, very literate, famous names like Sir Victor Sassoon, the last of the Sassoon family, the Hardoon family, the Kaduri family that became very prominent in Hong Kong, the Abraham family, the Sephardic community, which numbered maybe about 5,000 or 8,000, sometimes 10,000. Mm -hmm. They were the first ones there. They came in the middle of the 1800s. That's long before the Second World War. Mm -hmm. That was followed by the Russian Jewish community, which came down south, came from Siberia. They were up north in Siberia, Nikolaevsk on the Amur River in the northern tip of Siberia. They came down mm -hmm. into, uh, into China, and then the refugees came. Okay. So the community was 100 years old when the war started. Interesting. And the refugees came, they spent a few years there, maybe 10 years there they were there during the. They came in the, in the 30s or 1940s. They established and schools. They, they established, the only yeshiva to survive intact, the only Talmudical academy to survive from Europe, to survive intact during the war, were in Shanghai during, they were in Shanghai during the war. Interesting. And there was even a Jewish settlement or a Jewish ghetto uh, established in 1943 in Shanghai as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanted to mention to you also, there was a Shanghai incident. There was a Jewish hospital there. there really? Was a Jewish club there. There, was, there were several Jewish newspapers there. Are there, there any remnants of this now? Only the buildings, the Jews are not there. The refugees all left and the community left. When China went communist, Shanghai emptied itself of Jews, half to Israel and half to America. A number of years ago, we had a photographer who had been traveling around the world taking pictures of various Jewish communities. And he came to Comac and we had him for dinner. We had a very interesting conversation showed some of his pictures of amazing Jewish communities in the middle of nowhere, how there are still people in, in Portugal who are hiding their Judaism and being Moranos and so forth and so on. In any case, he, I asked him for his observation of what's going on around the, the, the world as far as how you would compare the American Jewish community with other Jewish communities. And it was very interesting to hear his reaction. He said that the American Jewish community is the only community he can see that has, for all practical purposes, adapted the ways of their local culture to such a great degree 
and he's just very concerned that it should be able to maintain some identity because almost any other Jewish community he'd visited, and he'd literally been around the world, he saw that there was a maintenance of a strong amount of tradition, language, as you mentioned, of being able to have a familiarity and a level of education concerning Judaism, which were in his mind, and he wasn't observant in any way himself, but were very, very key points of being able to continue Judaism. And he was very concerned about Judaism in America. Where based on your exposure into these different areas and seeing what has happened in other communities around the world, what's your opinion of what's going on in America today as far as the future of Judaism here in the States? About the future here in America? Right. Okay, I would say in the regard to your friendly photographer, if you go to India, where Jews have been living in the same place, same location for 2,000 years straight, they've very much adapted to the uh, local community, they're fluent in the language, behave just as all the other local people do. You cannot tell them well, apart. No, yeah, I don't think he was saying, he wasn't negating the possibility of a person adapting. They did not assimilate, did not intermarry, maintained themselves basically intact for 2,000 years, which really is amazing, speaks yeah. very well for them. Right. Did not happen in China, but it did happen, uh, did happen in India. I think the, uh, the Jewish community in America is in trouble. However, the key to the survival of a Jewish community in America will have to be education. The more we are knowledgeable, the more we are learned, the more we are involved in our tradition, mm -hmm. that's our best hope of survival. All right. Robert Okea, I happen to agree with you 100% on that. <laughs> but in any case, it's been a pleasure. My pleasure. Very, very interesting to hear all of your opinions of what's going on around the world. And I think that the main message that, that I take from what you're saying is that we also have to realize that we cannot take for granted our own Judaism. We can't take for granted our Jewish community. We can't take for granted the democracy and the the... United States of America either. We have to be very appreciative of what we have here and be able to take full advantage of it as far as knowing that this is a, a special time in Jewish history that is very unique, that has not happened it's to this degree. Opportunity. Definitely, there's no question about it. It's and just, just to, to take for granted that what we have is always going to be is very foolish because there's no guarantee of anything really. And this is a time, of course, that a Jew has the opportunity to find out whatever they want about being Jewish, about learning what Judaism has to offer, about anything in the world that has to do with Judaism. It's an incredible time with a burst of Jewish education, of day school education, of adult education, of any type of education you can possibly take imagine. Take advantage of this opportunity. Good. I agree 100%. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So now what we want to do is we want to be able to show our guests or our viewers a little bit of what's going on with Chabad around the island. So if anybody wants to, please write us at 58 Comac Road in Comac. That's 11725. Again, 58 Comac Road, Comac, New York, 11725. Our number is 462-7383. And of course, for any of your questions about Judaism or if you have any follow-up questions with Rabbi Tokayer, he happens to be a rabbi right here in Great Neck at the Cherry Hill Synagogue. I'm sure he'll be happy to answer any questions you might have to write to us about or to call us about. In addition, he takes tours I know all over the world as well. So I know a couple of people have gone in his tours. It's been very interesting. In addition, we have, of course, a website. We have our website address is ChabadLI.org. And we have a super phone, which is great for your kids, or great for anybody in the family to find out some more about what being Jewish is all about. The number for that is 516-76-SUPER. So in the meantime, I just want to let you all know that Judaism is there. We don't have to be in Shanghai. It's not difficult like it is in India. It's not impossible to be Jewish like it might have been during the war in different places. Judaism is there just for you to open the door, just for you to pick up the phone. In the meantime, see you next week. Same time, same station for the Jewish Spotlight. Shalom. Take care.